If you want a tutorial on what celebrities are doing, this is what you want to hear. Everything was too much, the pressure is too high. and What goes on in the real lives of celebrities? Behind the fame. Hollywire is bringing you behind the fame. What Hollywire? What is going on? <laughs> Hollywire in the house. What's up? <laughs> Colin Eccles, I just wanted to get him hyped up. I wanted to get him yeah. ready. Yeah, no, we're yeah. excited. Tony's yeah, a I'm huge excited fan. Too. Oh, I'm yeah. a fan no, too. But... I've seen this guy's career since yeah. when he first started. Uh, I'm, I've, I've been close with like your management team. I, I just know your so you. So you saw my Folgers commercial oh, when I first started. I Shut might have. This guy up. is yes. a stud, though. <laughs> really? Oh yeah. Well, well, yeah what yeah. was your first commercial? It was a Folgers coffee commercial where I'm on the subway, some guy walks in with a cup of coffee and <laughs> I have to smell it and, and then I start having to dance and like get all no. excited because like I love coffee. Oh my gosh. Yeah. How old are you when, when you did that? Uh, like teenager? This was when I was 25. Okay. So yeah. that's when it really all started for you. Yeah. So I just, you know, I wrote a book, Agile Artist, and mm-hmm. it pretty much pulls back the curtain and shows what the reality is for actors who are looking to get into the business because um, having come from nowhere small town USA outside of Chicago the idea yeah. of actually becoming a professional actor was like the last thing on my radar um, but I was living across the street from the World Trade Center and I'd finally wow. found my passion of acting ended up in a acting class in the East Village in New York City and for the first wow. time in my life having grown up not feeling like I really had a voice finally on stage I felt like wow I you know it's like I'm reading reading these amazing works from different playwrights and, and different authors and uh, getting to, you know, do scenes with beautiful women. Totally. And it was like, oh, my God, this girl, she's actually standing there <laughs> listening to me and not running off. Um, and so I finally found, like, you know what? This is, this is amazing. Acting was my the, uh, place where I felt like I could truly connect with people and yeah. start to f- discover who I really was. Um, and I was living across the street from the World Trade Center. Mm-hmm. And, for, and I was in New York for about three, four years. And... One morning, 9-11, I wake up and see the flames coming out of the tower and uh, people jumping out of the the top of the windows. I mean, it was it was insane. Insane. Yeah. So that's that's when life really got real for me. I was uh, 27 years old. And uh, this is the thing where, you know, it's like life is all about these these moments that can really define what your perception is and Mm -hmm. the path of your life for the rest of your life. And for me. I loved acting, but the idea of actually coming out here to Hollywood to make it happen was almost kind of overwhelming and insurmountable. Totally. But after seeing that kind of an experience where seeing people trapped up there and seeing people jumping out of these windows made me realize that, you know what, life is short. And if you truly care about something, if you are passionate and it is something you want to go after, why would you let anything stop you from going after it? Because I guarantee you, if any one of us was trapped up in those towers and someone came to us and said, you know, Tony, Jan, I'm going to give you a second chance at life. Mm-hmm. What are you going to do with it? Mm-hmm. I, I mean, that was the type of mindset I had where I was like, you know, at, after those towers fell down and I was running down the street as the towers were falling down, literally, um, I couldn't get back to my apartment for two weeks. When I finally did, I got in there, my windows were blown in, my place was destroyed. Oh I had 10 oh minutes to grab gosh. whatever I could put into my suitcase and leave. And at this point I was homeless. So I came back okay. to Chicago where I grew up mm-hmm. and uh, I started asking myself like, wh- what am I gonna do? What do- and what do I wanna do? And my, I, what I wanted to do was go out to Hollywood and become a professional actor. Totally. But I think a lot of us have these ideas of we wanna do something but for whatever reason, we don't pursue it because we think like, well, who am I to do that? Totally. Why would they pick me? How could I ever think that I could be the next Tom Cruise? Mm-hmm. And after seeing this life altering event happen in front of my eyes, I realized that, you know what? Why not? Why not? Why me? not? I didn't want to be 80 years old sitting in a retirement home thinking, what if? What if I would have just given it a shot? Yeah. And we let all these limiting beliefs, I discovered that you know, these self-defeating ideas Mm -hmm. pop into our head that just make us think like, well, I don't know, people are going to think I'm stupid or what if I fail or what if it doesn't work out? And what if then I have to go back to Chicago and people, you know, think like, ah, you know, you you went out there and it didn't work. So what are you going to do now? Right. Um, But in my mind, I came out here with the mindset of instead of going into these auditions of like, pick me, you know, I, I came into these auditions like, you know what, let's do this. I mean, I was just like, I was so galvanized yeah. by the idea of 
man, you know, you only get one shot at life sometimes. And I just, I just came out here with like this passion of really pursuing what I really cared about. Um, so so cool. I, I wasn't the most experienced. And this is what I talk about in my book. You don't have to be the, the smartest or the most experienced. It truly is who you are being and how you show up. Because mm -hmm. people just kind of like, I'd walk into these rooms and, they, and I, you could tell they were like, well, he's green. He doesn't really know the, yeah. all the technical <laughs> stuff of acting, like downstage, upstage, or you know, whatever, camera left. Um, but there's something about it, like he, he's just got that energy. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, to be successful in life, you just have to be connected to whatever that is. Totally. Do and you, you have. Do you inspire yeah. people for a living? I know. Wow. I am yeah, feeling inspired. like, I I'm like, know. is this what I want to do with do, my right? life? Yeah. Do I want to yeah. live here? Well, you like, guys are doing it. I mean, you, you guys, where, where do you guys yeah. come from? Um, like literally? Yeah. I'm from North Carolina. Okay. So, so what made you come out here? Um, this job, like yeah, literally not right? this exact job, but I want to be a TV host. So I kind of just took the plunge after college. Yeah. You did yeah. the same thing. Yeah. You were yeah. going to be an actor. I love the what if. Yeah. The what if is like, I live on the what if. Yeah. But for every one of you, there's like... 4,000 people that are like, well, I don't know, oh, you yeah. know, it's yeah, yeah. like, yeah, I mean, it's definitely know. like scary to kind of jump in and do that. But I think that's such good advice. Like day to day, like we're just not guaranteed that next right. day, you yeah, know, there's and no guarantee right. with anything. Things happen in life and make you realize that. So right. that's crazy that it was nine 11 for you though. Yeah. That's so wild. Yeah, and is that in the book? The, that story? Yeah. So book? that's, that's the first chapter. Well, great first chapter. <laughs> yeah. Well, like I'm in, yeah. I'm hooked. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. That spoiler, so, spoiler, just in case anybody has. Yeah, the book sorry, there. guys. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, that's that kind of just pulls you into the book, and right. then from there, it just kind of goes on because uh, you know, uh, <laughs> one of the pieces of advice my acting teacher, my first acting teacher, teacher gave us in the class was, um, it's going to take you ten years to become a working actor. Mm -hmm. It's going to take you twenty years to become mm -hmm. a good working actor. And if you're not ready to put in that kind of a commitment right now, there's the door. Yep. So right away, it was like, okay, this is real. And so when I came out here to Hollywood, um, you know, it's, it's funny because you, you meet a lot of people that come out here and they're like, yeah, I want to, you know, I want right. to be an actor. And I'm like, oh, right. where do you study? Oh, uh, well, I was thinking about studying here or I didn't like my acting uh -huh. teacher. So I, you know, I, I didn't do it. But, um, but I was planning on going to medical school and mm -hmm. the idea of, investing, you know, $200,000 in a medical school education, I was like, you know what? Um, I want to, I, I need to apply that same mentality to my mm -hmm. acting. And if I'm, if I'm really seriously going to book a job. So my, my advice to actors is you can't just go to an acting class once a week for mm -hmm. like two hours and expect to book an acting job. Totally. You've got to devote yourself and immerse yourself a thousand percent in whatever it is that you want to do, whether it's acting, whether it's hosting, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever it is you want to do. Mm -hmm. to be successful at it. Um, and you just got to, what I talk about in the book is you got to have a s specific plan about what it looks like. So I would create vision boards and write out goals. Yeah. And, you know, I do these visualization exercises where I'm actually like seeing myself in Paris doing a World War II love story. And wow. boom, two weeks later, I get an audition for a World War II Something. love story, book it. Um, after that, I ended up booking my first steady acting job on all my children yeah where i played uh eric kane's transplanted unaborted fetus son <laughs> what a title yeah um and so that was around eight years into when from when i had first started acting to when i booked, booked my that. first real steady mm -hmm. acting job so my acting teacher was pretty accurate when she said it's going to take you 10 years to book your first like real wow. acting job and so i was 32 years old ended up moving back to new york city and I have a three-year contract and I'm thinking I'm on top of the world. Perfect. <laughs> this is amazing. I'm finally making steady money. Yeah. I'm not having to, you know, I was building furniture out here in, in LA just wow. to make, you know, pay my bills and stuff. And so finally I'm like, all right, made it. And six months into my three-year contract, I got diagnosed with cancer. Oh my god. Really? Gosh. This is, yeah. And this is did, yeah. another part in, you know, my book. I talk wow. about how, okay, and that's why the name of my book is Agile Artist, because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the quality of being agile in life is so important, and especially nowadays, because things move so quickly and change so quickly. Um, I talk about how, you know, it's like when you hear those words, you have cancer, mm -hmm. you know, it's almost as if like, what do you mean, me? I... I, you know, like right. that happens to other people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, 
um, I had testicular cancer. And so I knew something was not right down there. It was, so I went to my doctor and they did blood test, uh, ultrasound. And I was on set on all my children on a Friday and my, I got a vote, uh, voicemail from my doctor saying I need you I need to see you in my office right away Mm -hmm. so I finished my scenes I went down to his clinic down the lower east side and uh he's like um uh you have advanced stage testicular cancer I'm scheduling you for surgery on Monday this needs to come out now and I had work on Monday and I was like well doc uh I'm an actor I'm Erica Kane's son, I've got to work on Monday. Can we do this maybe on Tuesday yeah. or something? And he was like, did you hear what I said? You have can't." And I didn't even, I, I didn't want to hear it. Totally. At, at first I was like, I just, okay, whatever. Just, uh, I need to, I, I, I need to do, keep as much normalcy in my life as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I think people can let a diagnosis or what people tell them then identify they they then they then identify themselves with that right so-called reality mm-hmm. and this is what i talk about in my book and once i was diagnosed with cancer they okay so he said yes you have cancer in my mind i was like as an actor we have to go into these auditions and create our own reality mm-hmm. i have to create myself to be a new character every time i walk into these auditions so true so i had the surgery then had uh, three weeks of radiation treatment. And so I was going in between, like every day, uh, I'd go to all my children, film my scenes, go to the hospital, get my radiation treatment. Hour later, feel like you want to vomit, throw up. You, mm. you, know, you feel like you have the flu. I'd go home and go to sleep and then wake up and do this over and over again. And three weeks into my radiation treatment, um, my scenes for all my children were later in the day. So I had to go get my radiation treatment in the morning. So I go there and then I show up on set and I'm just feeling nauseous mm-hmm. and just yeah. sick. And so I show up and then I go up on set and I'm trying to do this scene and I just like, I, I'm all like green and sweaty and my doctor ca- or uh, my director came up to me and he was like, Colin, are you, are you all right? You don't look so good. And I just, I, I broke down. I just, <sighs> I, I was trying to hold it all in. I didn't right. tell anyone at work that oh. I was diagnosed and oh, I had the wow. surgery. Because I didn't want any, anyone to know. Right. Uh-huh. Um, this is guy stuff. It's totally. private. Mm-hmm. I don't, you know, and, and I just didn't want anyone to f- feel sorry for me. Or I didn't mm-hmm. want to, it just, I, I didn't want, and I didn't want people to know me as the actor who right. had testicular can you know, it's just private stuff. Mm-hmm. But I realized after that three weeks of holding it all in, or I mean, at this point, it was like two months after the surgery and the diagnosis, um, I literally just started breaking. I broke down on set because I, I, I couldn't hold it in anymore. And I just felt alone and lot. afraid and scared because mm-hmm. I didn't know what if I was going to survive any of this. And uh, he was like, go tell our executive producer. Once I told her, she, you know, she was like, what, you know, why didn't you tell us? Yeah. We're a family here. And this is what I talk about. You know, a lot of times we're afraid to be vulnerable in our lives. Mm-hmm. And there is strength and vulnerability. And I realized once I did share that, my community showed up and um, I, I made, I became closer, my relationship, relationships became closer with the people that I was working with than before because then they saw me like as a real person. Because sometimes right. I think we can go through life just putting on the good act and the good faith. Oh, totally. how are you doing? Oh, everything's great. Everything's cool, man. How are you doing? Oh, everything's cool. Mm-hmm. And on the inside, you're you're just like frustrated and you, you, you know you're it's not what you portray. it's not you know like maybe you've been auditioning and you haven't booked the role and um and it's okay to be real mm-hmm. and i think what i have struggled with out here in los angeles is truly authentically connecting with people because it's hollywood and so mm-hmm. a lot of the times you feel like you've got to put on it's kind of plastic that, like amazing everything's amazing um but by doing that i think we isolate ourselves and this is what i talk about in the book as well Mm -hmm. um and then a year later the freaking cancer came back and i had to have another surgery and at this point i'm like what and i don't know if i can do this again Mm -hmm. um and i called my mom after the second diagnosis and she was like look you're an actor at this point you need to be a warrior you need Mm -hmm. to put your 
armor on and you need to go to battle. Mm -hmm. And I was, and this is why I love my mom so much. Cause she's just like a no nonsense. She's just like, all right, you got to deal with this. That's amazing. What are you going to do? And I was like, yeah, wow. I'm going to be a warrior. <laughs> so right. like, I, you know, I cut out a picture of Russell Crowe from Gladiator and I <laughs> stuck him on my wall. And so every month when I had to go to Sloan Kettering hospital to go for the blood test, chest x-rays, mm -hmm. Because the first place that cancer can manifest is in your lungs. And so Gosh. you go in there and you're like, all right, let's do this. You know, and, and on my calendar, I would write, I wouldn't write checkups or, you know, chest x-ray. I would write good health appointment. Mm -hmm. And it was to confirm that I was in good health. Right. So this is all like the mindset stuff that I started to adopt to really create the empowered perspective for me to be able to go through this. Because there's so many disempowering things that we experience in life that can mm -hmm. crush us. And totally. we can, it's easy for us to play the victim and mm -hmm. be like, oh, well, this happened and she did this to me and that blah, 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 blah. But as soon as you start to take responsibility and create an empowering perspective for yourself, then it not mm -hmm. only allows you to move forward, but I started to gain more confidence in myself and at, through this experience, yeah. it's those kinds of experiences that really, um, help you understand and define who you, who you want to be. So in these experiences, as difficult as life can be, they, you know, experiences like this provide you the opportunity to decide who you want to be. Because I always like to focus on knowing that there is going to be problems no matter what. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. been a big thing for me in, in, this man, in my positive manifestation. I already know there's going to be a valley. There's always, and there's yeah. like, I literally, my yeah. life goes six valleys up, six, yep. six valleys, I mean, six months up, six down. Yeah. It's, uh, there's always like this wave. Yeah. Uh, and so the way I always know I'm going to get back up is though I always know there's going to be a down. So Ooh. I just know, I just, I, like, you prepare like you, for you've, it. You've had, yeah. you, you've, you've had cancer twice. Yeah. You know, you've, you, you saw the World Trade Center uh, thing happen. Like these things are going to hit you again, yeah. no matter what. Like yeah. you're going to have a major, maybe life crisis. You're going to actually, yeah. no matter what, have mm -hmm. a major life crisis happen yep. again. And it's just accepting it yep. is like my always been uh, motto. And, and so I, cause I know I'm going to get past it. Yeah. I think that, and, that, um, I've had the opportunity to be coached and go to a lot of seminars and, hear a lot of different uh, actors and teachers and, and authors talk about different things. And there was this, uh, this Hollywood publicist named Michael Levine, who I heard speak once, and he talked about, um, you know, he represented a ton of, and still does, a ton of uh, celebrities and, yeah. and athletes and presidents. Um, and it was Michael Jackson's publicist, and wow. uh, he, he served three sitting presidents, and David Bowie, and Prince, and wow. I mean, oh, wow. Sharon Stone. I mean, you name it. This guy's like, and he's written 19 books, and he's represented you know thousands of different clients. And he was curious because he represented the elite, top of the mm -hmm. top, 1%, and then he said there were so many other actors and entertainers who had the same talent as like a Prince or a Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. And he was curious of like, why did they make it? And why right. were these other people who were just as talented, why, didn't, why weren't they mm -hmm. having the same level of, su of success? And he said, it came down to four major things. And the first one he said was, the people that are super successful, he calls them super successful, is that they have an obsession about what they do in life. Mm -hmm. So he described it as, the obsession was similar to how a heroin addict needs his mm -hmm. next hit Hicks, yeah. of heroin, it, where it was like you will they will stop at nothing to get it. Mm -hmm. So a super successful successful person will first ask you to move. He will then tell you to move, <laughs> and then he will knock your ass down right. to get there. And having worked with you know people like a Sylvester Stallone and did a movie with Kate Hudson and worked with Jennifer yeah. Love Hewitt on the client list. Um, and just working with a lot of these super successful people, it's, it's so true. I mean, they're, they're courteous, they're polite, but you know that they will bend yeah. people's wills to get what they want mm -hmm. because they believe in it in so, so much. Um, the second quality he said was they have super successful people have a strong relationship with their obligation to something, meaning they do what they say. So if they say that they are going to mm -hmm. uh, 
book this role or if they say that they're going to lose 30 pounds to yeah. be ready for this role or if they say that they're going to put <laughs> excuse me put out an album they do it they write it down in their calendar and they have a strong relationship with, with their obligations with their right. obligations yeah, yeah. And then he said the third one was they are optimistic and they look at life as a game. So similar to what you were saying before, you know that there's going to be peaks and valleys, mm -hmm. much like if you're an athlete, you know you're not going to win every, every game. game. Right. You know just that's part yeah. of the whole thing. And I think a lot of people are unrealistic thinking that, okay, well, I don't want to start this or do this or get into a relationship because I don't want to get hurt or I don't want right. to start this business because – what if I lose money or what if this happens or, well, you know what? It is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you get into a relationship with the idea that, well, what if I get hurt? Well, then you most likely are going to get, I mean, you're at some most point likely you're, you're going to get, get hurt, hurt anyway. anyway. Yeah. But yes. Yeah. But if you know that it is going to happen, right. But you focus on how to, how to minimize that or how to totally. accept, make it. Accepted. Yeah. It's really accepting. And, yeah. And mm -hmm. how to, focus on the, the, the great parts mm -hmm. so that you're, you're feeding the great parts and minimizing as much as po possible the, yeah. the negative parts, then you know that, okay, that's just going to be part of the, part of the journey. You can almost like control what kind of hurt it is, right? Kind of. Cause it's like, you know, it's going to happen. So how, what can we do, whether it's a relationship or your career to make it like the least hurtful thing in a way you know what i'm saying like yeah, we, we know that this here. could we happen yeah. that's we like kind of deep but like deep. you kind of control why, it now we can go deep that's why now. therapists are yeah. you know in business yeah that's true, that's <laughs> true. well the, the the thing with pain the thing with pain everybody feels like when you have pain they feel like you're the only one in pain you're the only yeah. one yeah. who might have that feeling of pain yeah. but the thing about human beings are we are all this universal thing together we mm -hmm. all have had pain so correlating mm -hmm. it if you really think about it you should accept it mm -hmm. because from a public standpoint we all have pain it's going to happen no matter what right. and once you can like let that part go yeah because the part is holding it in with yourself i'm the only one that has this pain I, yeah. you yeah. can't let it out like you said being vulnerable and letting your right. vulnerability out is like that's when the pain you release it to the world and you're like yeah. you, you can get over it the, the, yeah you back up again and i think it's important not to discredit people's pain mm -hmm. right because i think a lot of the times 100 if someone is a lot of times people act out or do bad things because they're in pain mm -hmm. and i think it's very easy just to judge someone and say well they're just a bad person because they did something bad mm -hmm. yeah but if you try to understand why they did something like that or like if someone hurts you in a relationship the first thing, the easiest thing to do is you hurt me. You're an asshole. Like I hate you. I'm never going to. Yeah. But if you find it, like it, if you, if you're able to, to stop yourself and, and one of the most important things you can develop as a human being is emotional intelligence. If you write out, okay, which brain. So if like you say like, okay, I want to, I want to, I want to lose weight. Mm -hmm. So you write, okay, I want to lose weight. That's my conscious brain. And then any desire that you have, like, I want to eat, like, I want to eat that cake right there. Okay. Is that, is that decision coming from your mammalian brain uh -huh. or your reptilian brain? Um, I want to go talk to that girl over there sitting at the bar. Mm -hmm. Is it because, is that my mammalian brain mm -hmm. or is that my conscious brain? Mm -hmm. And if you can look at, if it lines up with what is in line with what you truly want in life. So like with me, I want to be a professional actor mm -hmm. any decision that was not in line with that so like if i wanted to stay out late to like four o'clock in the morning and you know or uh eat that extra mm -hmm. cookie or whatever it was if it wasn't in line with my conscious higher purpose of becoming an actor then i did as as you know mm -hmm much as I could to avoid then making that decision. Right. And if we start to unpack where our motivations are and where our decisions truly come from, then we start to gain a little more leverage uh, in, control, in the sense almost. of and control of, is this yeah. in higher purpose of what I want in life? And you can't deny yourself something. You've got to create something more motivating and mm -hmm. more inspiring. So you can't just say, I'm going to quit smoking. 
you can't just say like, okay, I'm going to stop smoking. You got to make it where, okay, if I quit smoking, then I'm going to gain this. Gain this. And yeah. you got to focus on what the benefit of, of it is that you're going to have compared to saying no to something because we're just not, most of right. the time, not that We need to almost like replace it with something. Yeah. Otherwise, we're going to go crazy. Yeah. Right? The more we deny <laughs> ourselves something, the yeah. more we, we just like, oh, I want it. I got to have it. And right. Yeah. There's that phrase. Here we go. Okay. Blank music puts me in a good mood. I would say I, so I, I run a lot. I do triathlons and oh, wow. I always love listening to house music. You, <laughs> you. He loves house from music. Chicago, yo <laughs> yeah. cascade. Love cascade. Okay. Um, my mom always tells me, she always tells me <laughs> to keep my shirt on when I'm working. <laughs> Oh my God. When I got booked on All My Children, she was like, Oh, I'm so proud of you, honey, but just make sure you keep your clothes on. I was like, Mom, it's a soap opera. I, I, like, I'm going to have to show my. She's so guy. conservative. She's from so Ireland. Cute. She's so sweet. Um, but she's always keep like, Just on. keep your damn clothes on. Oh on. my God. That's hilarious. Okay, speaking of, my favorite piece of clothing is. Uh, my favorite piece of clothing is, uh, I, you know, one of my good friends, he's a, he's a designer. His name is Simon Spur. And I've got this navy blue sweater that I, I sleep in. I wear, like, it's just my, it's like my, it's my blanket. It's my comfort blanket. Navy blue yeah, sweater. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Simon Spur. He's, he's the man. You ready? Yeah. Ready to spill the tea? <laughs> okay. I, <laughs> I feel like I can't even ask you this. What is it? Um, I have a celebrity crush on. Oh. oh. I feel like. I mean, you've worked with some like serious babes in the oh, industry. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. So, so yeah. <laughs> I mean, whatever it may be, Anybody. but I'm just saying you've had to have, you know. I would say, I mean, Scarlett Johansson. Beautiful. Beautiful. Fiance's name is Colin as well, oh, yes. which, you know, but. Um, her fiance's name? Her fiance, yeah. Colin oh, Jost from oh, yes. Saturday Night Live. Yes, this is, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's. And. Uh, um, and then Melanie <laughs> Laurent, who was in uh, *Inglorious Bastards*. Okay. She's another one. Um, however, I. Uh, He's got more. <laughs> I love this. Well, I, I've got an amazing girlfriend myself, so I would say she's my, she's my crush. She's your crush. Ah, yeah, yeah. we love that. We love that. So cute. Love Colin, that. you're yeah. awesome. Thank yeah. you so much Thanks, for hanging guys. out with us today and inspiring yeah. us. Guys. Did you guys all oh get inspired? Oh my gosh, what? I am. I'm Listen, like, if you want more, go to colinagglesfield.com. <laughs> yeah, go get that book. Yes. Agile Artist on Amazon, Barnes Noble, all that good stuff. I'm excited. We'll and if you want to, if you want to put your life on steroids and and accomplish some great stuff, totally. my Inspire course is available online as well. Thank Heck you. yeah! Thank you yeah. so much. Bye, Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.